Hi everyone and welcome back to another English with Dry. Today we are looking at a third monologue from Macbeth. This time it is from Act 3, Scene 1. At this point in the play, Macbeth has become King of Scotland, but he's not satisfied. He talks about how being thus, being king, is nothing unless he can be king safely. He cannot relax until he feels secure in this position, and the thing that's stopping him from feeling this is the prophecy relating to Banquo. Now, he talks about how he has fear of Banquo, and he talks of Banquo's royalty of nature. Now, this is interesting because it refers back to what the witch has said about how his children will one day be king. Um, however, it could also imply that Banquo's moral nature and unbending loyalty would make him a good king himself. Banquo is often seen as the foil of Macbeth in this play, and so the fact that he is so um, kingly and royal and good really does contrast with Macbeth, who obviously becomes a, a loathsome tyrant. Now, he continues to say that Banquo's got a wisdom that guides his valour. Now, this is sort of him becoming a, more and more paranoid and worrying more about how good a person Banquo is. But what's interesting is the use of the word valour, because that was the word that was used to describe Macbeth in Act 1, Scene 2, when the captain called him... Uh, but Valor's minion. Now, the fact that he is no longer got this Valor reinforces how cowardly and traitorous, sorry, treacherous his act was. And so therefore Valor as a, as a, def as a description has been passed on to Banquo, who deserves it far more. He, find he continues talking about how he fears that his genius will be rebuked it is said Mark Antony's was by Caesar. Now, this is a reference to Shakespeare's play Antony and Cleopatra, where Macbeth is comparing himself to Antony. In the play, he is warned by a soothsayer to stay away from Octavius Caesar, because otherwise um, Caesar will overthrow Antony. Now, that is exactly what happens, and even more fittingly, they were once both friends as well. And just like Mark Antony is left with nothing, this is what Macbeth fears will happen to him. He continues and starts to think more about what the witch has said, and he compares them to prophets. Now, this kind of shows the, where Macbeth is at in terms of his morality. Now, it, the fact that he compares them to prophets shows the death of his soul and the kind of his departure from these Christian values, because clearly that is not a word that anyone in the Jacobean era would associate with witches, who would be considered to be the absolute, the absolute archetypes of evil. He says that they talked about how he would be head of a line of kings. Now, if we think more about the Jacobean era generally, this was um, a time when James VI and I was king. Now, he himself believed that Banquo was one of his um, great, great ancestors. And so, therefore, there's a reason why Banquo was written in such a positive and admirable way. Shakespeare is trying to, you know, curry favour with James, almost, in or by doing this. Macbeth then engages in, quite, in some quite interesting imagery. He talks about his fruitless crown and barren scepter. Now, these images are metaphors designed to show that he is essentially useless. He is like a tree, incapable of producing fruit. The word barren, as well, of course, connotes the inability to have children. But it also all points towards his own impotence, especially with the imagery around the scepter. And he starts to become angry at this thought that he has done all of this, all of this underhand deeds in vain. He talks about how he's worried that this will all be taken from him or wrenched from him, a kind of violent word, with an unlineal hand. He's starting to imagine that Banquo was quite literally plotting to murder him and deliver the crown to his own sons, much like he did himself with Duncan. And then he, he sort of concludes with how he has filed his mind all for Banquo's children, not his own. Now, filed here meaning defiled, literally ruined and made disgusting. He is aware of his own deteriorating mental state, his increasing anxiety, his increasing paranoia. And then he calls this a, a rancor, which is a sort of bitterness that he has put into his own, into his own peace of mind. And... 
he talks of his eternal jewel. Now, this is his immortal soul that he has sacrificed and given to the common enemy of man, or Satan. You know, he is aware of his eternal damnation that faces him for what he has done. And this is something that he thinks was only worth it if it meant that he could father a long line of kings himself. And so in the end of the monologue, he talks of what he will do. He talks of fate, which is interesting, and he says for the first time that he is going to challenge fate. Now, this is the first time in the play that Macbeth actually seeks to alter the, th the course of action that the witches and, you know, fate, if you think that, have have foretold will take place. He says that he is going to almost do battle and challenge fate, almost as though it is in a sort of battlefield, in order to control his own destiny and create an outcome for himself that he wants. And so with our five box summary, firstly Macbeth is unable to enjoy his kingship as his paranoid Banquo will overthrow him. He admires Banquo's qualities and so feels fears, fear towards nobody except Banquo. He speaks of the witch's prophecies, recalling that exactly what they promised to Banquo, which would be a, a line of kings. He's worried that the crown he has gained is worthless and that he sacrificed his soul for absolutely no reason. And so finally he decides that he will take matters into his own hands and almost wrestle back uh, this fate and his... Uh, and control of his own destiny. Thank you all for watching, do like and subscribe, and I will see you for another video.